Good evening. I'm Craig Thompson, President and CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I'm really pleased to welcome all of you uh, who are joining this virtual symposium entitled 2021's Major Trends in Modern Cancer Research. This is the 16th annual event that we've held, um, and we're really pleased uh, to be able to provide this opportunity to get, share with you the excitement of research, biomedical research in all of its guises, both in the hospital to take care of patients that face cancer diagnoses and the things we do here to try and improve that. Cancer today is, no matter where you are in the world, one of the most feared diseases we have for our loved ones and ourselves. And so the efforts that we have in research have a real meaning, but it also is an exciting place to carry on biomedical research and to see the potential of some of the things you've learned in your classwork about training and different techniques where we can learn to ask and address scientific problems. So we wanna do this, even though it's virtual, this time with our 16th annual major trend symposium. It's a little different in format. This is the second year we've done it virtually in the past, and I know for our local area high school students, it's exciting to come here and be in the room with your other students from different high schools that have actually been excited by the sciences and want to learn about by participating in this thing. We would have fed you some pizza, we'd have shown you the research labs, and then you would have gotten to hear three of our exciting uh, early career scientists and the exciting things they're able to do in their laboratories and in their clinical care. Um, we're going to do the latter half for sure today, and so we've got three terrific speakers. Um, unfortunately, though, it's online, so we can't have you here in the room. So myself and our colleagues are here in a big empty auditorium reaching out into the virtual space to talk to you all. We are still going to try and share some of the excitement we have about cutting-end research at a career in science by doing this. These are only examples. We have over 200 scientists and over 1,200 physicians who come together every day at Memorial Sloan Kettering, practicing science into medicine to improve both our understanding, our diagnosis, and treatment of cancer. Um, so we're gonna hear three 20-minute talks. The key to how this thing is organized to be successful is after they give their talk, we are gonna open up your, um, uh, we're gonna, Actually, just to understand in the virtual format, we're gonna be turning off your cameras and your microphones for the event, but the chat function is gonna be completely open. And our Dean, Michael Overholz, who is in charge of all of our training programs, including many of our internship programs in the summer, uh, will be actually looking at that chat and transferring the questions at the end of each presentation. Um, the challenge I give every year, the objective of your questions is if you've been listening and paying attention and you challenge our speakers enough, you'll get one or more of them to say, we just don't know the answer. The excitement of biomedical research is answering questions we still don't understand about how our bodies work, why disease occurs, and why cells that come together, this social collection, have failed to work effectively to maintain our health. And that's what we do by studying the problem of cancer, a disease that affects every organ in our body because every cell, because we are animals that flee danger and hunt food, can be damaged and has to be regenerated. And we now know that those are the cells that are at risk for this disease we cause cancer, where they start to make copies of themselves rather than replacing the tissues that need to be repaired as we damage ourselves. So with that, um, we're really looking forward to some great questions from you. Um, you can follow us along as uh, each of the speakers has a social media contact that we will we will give you that contact at the end of the meeting. Um, and we're hoping to introduce you to other things at Memorial Sun Kettering through their presentations, including applications for our various summer programs, which will open up on December 6th. You can also write to individual faculty members here. Our faculty members that you see present and others are welcome to questions from the rising STEM community in our high schools and colleges and looking for people that want to come during the summertime when we open our laboratories to opportunities for internships as we go forward. So with that, as an introduction, I want to introduce our first speaker, Vinod Balasrandran. Vinod is a surgeon. He specializes in treating patients with cancer of the pancreas, the gallbladder, bile ducts, and the liver, those central organs that we learn something about in science classes but probably have never seen unless you get to come and hang out with somebody like Vinod, who's regularly doing surgeries to be life-saving initiations of cancer treatment. But Vinod's also a scientist. 
He's a member of our Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, a leading immunotherapist in his own right, and a member of our David Rubenstein Center for Pancreatic Cancer Research, where he leads immunologic approaches to the treatment of pancreatic cancer. His background is that he got a degree in physics at Cornell. He then attended medical school at SUNY, at Sony Brook. And um, we're really pleased that he's joined our faculty a few years ago. His laboratory is in one of our research programs that we call HOP, and he studies rare cancer patients that have exceptional outcomes to our therapies, particularly immunotherapy. And he's developing new methods to harness the immune system to potentiate immunotherapy. So with that introduction, Vinod, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, and thank you to all of you. We're really excited for all of you to join us here this evening so that we can share with all of you exceptional, young, bright minds, some of our most latest, most exciting discoveries in cancer research. My name is Vinod Balachandran. I am a surgeon here at Sloan Kettering. I take care of patients with pancreatic cancer and I also run a laboratory in our human oncology and pathogenesis program where doctors work to discover new drugs to treat cancer. So you may have learned in biology that cancers arise when a normal cell transforms into an abnormal cell and then multiplies and spreads. So for decades now, doctors and scientists have been trying to understand this process because if you understand how this works, you can then develop drugs to stop it. So one of the first biggest discoveries was when scientists discovered that one of the key changes that causes a normal cell to transform into an abnormal cell is that these abnormal cells in fact divide faster than normal cells. This led to the development of drugs that block the machinery that cells use to divide. And these drugs, called chemotherapies, they shrink cancers, prolong life, but rarely do they eradicate cancers. One of the next major discoveries was when scientists, many here, in fact, at Sloan Kettering, discover that one of the key changes that causes a normal cell to transform into an abnormal cell are breaks in its DNA or mutations. These mutations, which then instruct these cancers to multiply and spread. This then led to the development of drugs to then block these mutations. And these uh, targeted therapies were even better than chemotherapies in that they were able to shrink cancers, prolong life, but unlike chemotherapies, were able to do this with fewer side effects. But what we've now learned is that although these mutations instruct cancer cells to multiply and spread, they can also be its Achilles heel because our immune systems are able to recognize some of these mutations and in fact kill these cancer cells. As part of our normal physiology to limit or minimize mutations or errors developing in our DNA. So now therapies that boost our immune system's ability to do this, immunotherapies can now shrink cancers, prolong life, but unlike the chemotherapies and targeted therapies, in some patients can in fact eradicate these cancers. So what does this look like? So this looks a little bit like this. So on the left of your screen, what you're seeing here is a picture of a patient with metastatic melanoma or skin cancer. And what you're seeing there are uh, a picture of her upper thigh and all of these black nodules that you see are skin cancers in her thigh that have also spread to other portions of her body. So this patient stopped responding to chemotherapies and targeted therapies. However, in November of 2006, this patient received one of the first doses of an experimental immunotherapy here at Sloan Kettering. So note the timestamp there, 
just two months later after a single dose of this experimental immunotherapy, what you can see here is eradication of all of these cancers in not just her thigh, but also in the rest of her body, just leaving these black melanin pigmented tattoos remaining on her thigh. And I can tell you now, 14 years later, she remains free of cancer and is in all likelihood cured. So uh, we think immunotherapy can be potentially more of everything. It can be more powerful because it can go from what you see on the left of your screen to what you see on the right of your screen, something that chemotherapies and targeted therapies couldn't do. We think immunotherapy can be more specific as the immune system can selectively recognize and kill cancer cells, but not normal cells. So this allows for the possibility to develop drugs with fewer side effects. Immunotherapy has the tantalizing possibility of memory. For chemotherapies and targeted therapies, you stop the drug, the cancer comes back. However, with immunotherapies, it allows the possibility of giving a limited number of doses of the drug, and, but still being able to control the cancers. Finally, immunotherapy potentially could be universal, as we now believe that the immune system can essentially recognize all cancers. So in theory, you could potentially boost the immune system to fight any cancer. So of course, this raises the question, well, then how do you go from what you see on the left of your screen to the right of your screen? So the immunotherapies or the class of immunotherapies that worked for this patient, although they worked really well for this patient, this only accounts for about 20% of current cancers. So for about 80% of current cancer patients, these current immunotherapies don't work. Now, one such cancer for which current immunotherapies don't work is pancreatic cancer, which also happens to be one of the most immunotherapy-resistant cancers. Also, although we've made a lot of progress in decreasing cancer death rates for other cancers, such as lung cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer, for pancreatic cancer, over the past 50 years, the death rate has remained largely unchanged. The current treatments for pancreatic cancer include surgery to remove the cancer, chemotherapy, and radiation. But in spite of these treatments, the current survival rate for pancreatic cancer remains only 9%. And because of this, pancreatic cancer will become the second deadliest cancer in the United States in only four years. All of you have no doubt already started to feel this with many prominent celebrities and personalities dying of pancreatic cancer recently. For example, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Alex Trebek, Congressman John Lewis, and many, many others. So pancreatic cancer has a very high unmet medical need and is urgently in need of new ideas. So uh, what is our new idea? So I mentioned to you that 91%, the majority of pancreatic cancer patients are short-term survivors. So they live for five years or less after their diagnosis with current treatments. However, not all pancreatic cancer patients die. And a rare subset of pancreatic cancer patients that account for about 9% of all pancreatic cancer patients, in fact, are able to live long-term. So for the past six years, we've been studying, essentially asking the question, what is different about the patients on the right of your screen to the patients who are on the left of your screen? And can, by understanding how they differ, can we take this knowledge and develop new drugs? So in 2015, we started this initiative. And in 2017, uh, what we discovered was that although the short-term survivors, which account for most of the pancreatic cancer patients, have few T cells in their tumors, these long-term survivors, in fact, very interestingly, had a lot more T cells in their tumors. And not just a lot by a small amount, but it was in fact a lot by a large amount 12 times more T cells in their tumors. So what is a T cell? 
So uh, T cell is a highly specialized immune cell in our body that protects our body against a variety of threats such as viruses and cancers. And a T cell does this by recognizing these specialized proteins called antigens that are found on virus infected cells as well as in cancers. And when a T cell sees this antigen, what it does, it, it expands and then expands to clear the threat and once the threat is cleared, it doesn't in go away and it sticks around. And sometimes it can stick around for, in fact, decades. The idea being it's sticking around so that it can re-expand if the threat reoccurs. So in essence, if you uh, subject a patient to an antigen or you expose them to an antigen, you can, in fact, protect against the threat. And of course, all of you know this principle because this is the principle underlying vaccination. So uh, what we in fact saw in long-term survivors was not only did they have 12 times more T cells in their tumors, these T cells persisted in their blood for very long periods of time, up to 12 years later. And we could in fact tell that they were the exact same T cells that were found in the patient's tumors because every T cell has a unique genetic barcode that makes it look different from other T cells in the body. So this to us resembled a sort of auto vaccination, if you will. So then we asked, well, if this is what is happening spontaneously in this patients, could we potentially in fact replicate this by actually giving a vaccine? But in order to do that, then we would need to answer the question, well, what are the relevant antigens that we would then use in a vaccine? So we then went on to identify that these antigens that we think that these T cells are responding to are in fact mutations in these patients' cancers. And what was actually quite interesting about this was that these mutations were in fact individual to each patient. So if you were to make a vaccine, this would have to be a custom made vaccine for every single patient. So to answer this question, could we then give this uh, mutations as vaccines? This triggered two additional questions. Number one, which mutations would we pick? And number two, how would we custom make these vaccines fast? Because of course, no patient wants to be waiting for their custom made vaccine. So to answer these questions, we then went on to develop a computational strategy to identify out of all of the mutations in uh, cancer, which are the mutations that we think the T cells are in fact recognizing. And then to answer this second question of how would you custom vaccinate a patient, we then reasoned that one of the probable simplest ways to be able to take these mutations that you see in a patient's tumor and deliver it to a patient in the form of a vaccine would be to encapsulate these uh, mutations into an mRNA molecule and then deliver the mRNA molecule to the patient. This of course was before the success of mRNA vaccine technology for the prevention of uh, COVID-19. So we went on to then select mRNA vaccine technology as one of the most promising technologies that we thought would be ideal to then take these mutations and deliver it to patients. And then we looked around for a variety of uh, biotechnology companies that we could then partner with to bring these new exciting discoveries to patients. So uh, among the companies that we uh, were talking to, one of the companies sort of jumped on this opportunity to do this, which back then was a little bit less well-known company, but now is a much more well-known company, a company called BioNTech, of course, all of you know this company as the uh, company that makes mRNA vaccines for COVID-19 that is distributed by Pfizer. So our group then partnered with uh, BioNTech to make these uh, custom-made mRNA vaccines for pancreatic cancer. And in uh, 2019, we started the first clinical trial of mRNA vaccines for pancreatic cancer here at MSK. And this was, of course, before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So you may ask, well, how did you go about to custom making these vaccines uh, for these patients? So our strategy here was that 
when patients come here to Sloan Kettering, we would first remove their tumors with surgery. And these, are, of course, are quite complex cancer surgeries. In fact, some of the most complex cancer surgeries that we do, sometimes taking up to six to eight hours. So once we take the tumors out, we then ship the tumors within 72 hours to our partners in BioNTech in Germany, where they start making these custom-made mRNA vaccines for these patients. While this is happening, these patients undergo, they recover from surgery, they get additional immunotherapy, and then within nine weeks of their surgery, they get treated with these custom-made mRNA vaccines, after which they go on to have uh, additional treatments. So this was the first clinical trial to test mRNA vaccines in pancreatic cancer patients. And this was based upon our scientific findings of what we think is happening in these long-term survivors. So uh, we started the first clinical trial of mRNA vaccines for pancreatic cancer here at MSK in 2019. And in 2020, of course, we were, New York especially, was the epicenter of this global uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which posed significant challenges, not just for clinical cancer care, but also for global supply chains. Uh, but uh, thankfully, both our team as well as the team at BioNTech were up to the challenge. Um, we were able to, in this, uh, even in this difficult scenario, not slow down the clinical trial, but in fact do the complete opposite and accelerate the clinical trial and in fact complete the clinical trial one year ahead of schedule. So uh, we're very excited about this clinical trial because we think it will provide very important information on the ability to use mRNA vaccine technology to treat pancreatic cancer, but also potentially other cancers as well. So just to summarize, you know, we think we have identified an initial strategy to select antigens that we could then use in cancer vaccines. And we are now testing these strategies in early clinical trials in pancreatic cancer patients. And then our goal is to then take what we learned from these initial early clinical trials, build upon it, and then take it further on to future larger clinical trials, as well as to other cancers in the future. So with that, I would just like to highlight that we have a huge team of scientists and doctors and, and all other staff here at MSK to, to bring uh, an effort like this together. I just want to highlight all of them, really a great team effort, also a great team effort between academia uh, and industry. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for all of your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. one we got. Um, you mentioned pancreatic cancer is the second deadliest cancer. And the very first question you got was, well, what's the first? The first, the leading cause of cancer death is lung cancer. So it is much more common uh, than pancreatic cancer. So it causes more deaths than pancreatic cancer. Um, one thing that I did highlight was that even though lung cancer causes more cancer deaths than pancreatic cancer, we have actually made a lot of improvement in treatments for lung cancer as the cancer deaths from lung cancer have been steadily decreasing because we have a lot more drugs to be able to treat patients with lung cancer. For pancreatic cancer, however, uh, we, we are not quite there yet, and we really need to get there, which is what we're working on. Okay, two therapy-related questions. There are many questions pouring in here, which is wonderful. Thank you, everyone. First, um, can immunotherapy be combined with chemotherapy and targeted therapy? So the short answer of that is yes, it can. And the current class of immunotherapies that work for the 20% of cancer patients where it's effective, we are now learning how to effectively combine immunotherapy with the other therapies that came before it, chemotherapies and targeted therapies. However, for these other 80% of cancers where the immunotherapies that we have right now are not working yet, we don't know how to do this yet. But this is exactly what not just us here at MSK, but the whole field is, is laser focused on to try to, to figure out. 
and potentially related for the vaccine idea, would patients need only one vaccine? So this is a great question. Um, we think uh, the number of doses that you would need for to vaccinate against cancer uh, versus vaccinating against uh, a virus or a bacteria is likely to be different. Why is that? Well, it's because we think vaccinating against a cancer is intrinsically a little bit more of a difficult problem. You're trying to mount an immune response against, in essence, yourself, uh, rather than vaccinating and mounting an immune response against a foreign a pathogen. So because of that, we think that the, the whole challenge is a little bit different and a little bit more challenging to vaccinate against cancer. And one of the ways uh, we hope to overcome that is perhaps by increasing numbers of doses. A couple attendees would like to know, what makes pancreatic cancer so resistant to immunotherapy? Um, well, this is a, a very interesting question, that a question that no one in fact knows the clear answer to, and we're all trying to figure this out. Um, I think one of the reasons is because we've now uh, uh, unlocked one way to activate the immune system to fight cancer. But there's probably we think many other ways to unlock the immune system to fight cancer. And pancreatic cancer and many of these other cancers, we think will require a different approach to activate the immune system than the one that we have now. So it perhaps is not so much that it is resistant to all immunotherapies, it's just that we haven't identified the right way to do it yet. Uh so would the mRNA vaccines be effective against other kinds of cancer as well? So this is, this is the hypothesis that we have right now um, and that the hypothesis that we are testing in pancreatic cancer patients. And depending upon uh, what we find, our goal is to then test it in, in other cancers as well. Um, theoretically, we do not think there is any particular reason why it would not be applicable to other cancers other than pancreatic cancer. And could you potentially vaccinate a normal person without any previous history of cancer? Ah, so uh, this is also an interesting question. Um, the, um, the role of vaccination to prevent cancer is a very um, tantalizing um, approach that doctors would love to, if we could figure it out, actually do it. We don't know how to do that yet, but perhaps after we figure out how to vaccinate against established cancer, we can then move towards the even earlier phases and in fact, prevent cancer even before they develop. But this is absolutely a long-term goal. So I think we have time for maybe two more. Um, they're related. So first, can immunotherapies target other kinds of cells besides T cells? Uh, immunotherapies can target other types of cells other than T cells. This is true. Um, we think T cells uh, appear to be the most important of the immune cells that uh, we need to be able to fight cancer. But there are several other important cells uh, that play a critical role in fighting cancers. In fact, another approach that we are working on in the laboratory is to activate other immune cells uh, to fight cancer, which I didn't have time to talk about today, but this is an active area of research uh, from our group and many others here. And perhaps this could be one reason why some of these other cancers have been resistant to the current immunotherapies, because maybe you need to activate other cells as well. And uh, related question, so what's the difference between an mRNA vaccine as a form of therapy and CAR-T therapy, another kind that many of our attendees have heard of before? Yeah, so uh, CAR-T therapy is a therapy where you actually modify, genetically modify the receptor of a T cell to target a particular antigen that you know. So for a CAR therapy strategy to work, you need to have an antigen that you know if you target it, you can kill the cancer, and then you can develop a genetically modified receptor and then put that into a T cell or another cell, for example, an NK cell, and then transfer these expanded cells into the patient's body. 
This works really well when you know what the antigen is. However, for uh, pancreatic cancer and many of these other cancers, it's not exactly clear what the antigen is. And there also may be more than one antigen. So these are some of the reasons why we think CAR therapy perhaps may not be the most effective for solid tumors such as pancreatic cancer and why we chose a vaccine approach where we can in fact cover a broader range of antigens. Okay, great. Uh, thank you everyone for the great questions and Vinod, thank you very much for your insightful responses. Thank you all for your time and questions. Well, by my count, it took to the third question to get Vinod to acknowledge that the field doesn't know the answer. So you're thinking about the most important and exciting part of research, as I hope he imparted to you, which is a trying an hypothesis, seeing if it works, and that's how we advance science, using those scientific principles of hypothesis generation and then testing that hypothesis. Um, the other thing I will remind you that T cells are the excitement of the day. And so Vinod has told you that they're the central regulators of the immune system. But I just to, for complete deposition, because we have others that unfortunately you will not be exposed to here, one of the other really exciting things that's coming out of vaccinology is the use of monoclonal antibodies, antibodies that arise by stimulating the immune cell against a specific protein or antigen, as Vinod just told you about. And two, two antibodies that are revolutionizing breast cancer and the treatment of certain forms of leukemia are actually antibodies that you've heard of as Herceptin or antibodies that you've heard against a molecule called CD20, another B cell marker uh, that can be used to harness for the immune response. So we know that there are, as Vinod said, there are many parts of the immune system and both how we can regulate those responses and what each component regulates is what he's talking about, these, about the exciting future. So our next speaker is Gretchen Deal. Gretchen's an associate member of our Sloan Kettering Institute's immunology program. Uh, Gretchen started out, it's actually apropos, she went to Pomona College and studied two fields. She studied biology and sociology. So biology, and that's why she's here today with us, but sociology to understand how different organisms live together, sometimes of the same species, sometimes as other species, as she's gonna tell you about. Um, she went on to get her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, and had her first faculty position at Baylor, Bar Baylor College of Medicine in Texas, where we were lucky enough a couple of years ago to recruit her to our broader immunology efforts. Gretchen's really interested in studying us as social organisms. We live together with just as many of our cells, the 60 trillion cells you bring in that you made during development after uh, as you grew up as a kid, and the more than 100 million, we now estimate, bacteria that live in our intestine and on our skin. They are critical in shaping our immune response. So sometimes, Vino told you how we start with a patient and learn by understanding that patient's response what we might do to advance our understanding of immunology into the clinic. Sometimes we start with basic questions of biology in our Sloan Kettering Institute and ask several questions. How do we sort out the bacteria we want to live with because they help us, they provide vitamins. We share our food with them and in turn to that, they turn certain foods into critical nutrients that we need to maintain our health. And how do we sort that out from the bacteria that could actually damage us, that caused the infections, that kept you out of school, that did other things. And Gretchen's been right at the forefront of that work, which is studying how the immune system shapes and is shaped by the microbiome that lives within our intestines. And I'm pleased to have her up to the podium to tell us how she uses mouse models to study the interaction between the bacteria in our intestines and the immune T cells that Vinod has so ably introduced us to. So, so thank you so much for that kind, uh, generous introduction. Um, and um, yeah, the, uh, the, the talk before I think is gonna be very different from, um, from mine. Vino's work is obviously much more um, applicable to um, things we can do now. And I think he's really um, 
push the envelope pretty far for, you know, how you can take some of the information from the patients and, and do some pretty amazing things. So I was, I was pretty impressed by that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a much more simple story um, of some basic immunology about how um, the immune system can understand what goes on in our intestine. And so I think it's become clear that all human disease is an act interaction between the person, the individual, their genetics, um, and the immune system and the environment. And the environment, the immune system, the genetics all work together to promote health. They can all work together um, to promote disease. And when we're talking about um, environmental contributions to health or disease, they're myriad. There's your diet, there's how much sleep you're getting, there's things that obviously cause disease like smoking. Um, and then the one that I'm very interested in is the microbiome. So the microbiome or the microbiota, microbiome is the um, organisms, the microbiota are the genes plus all, are the organisms plus all their genes, um, live on us and in us um, from when we're born. And so as, as just mentioned, um, we are outnumbered. So we are actually more microbial than human. Um, and we just carry them around with us. And we do this for very many reasons, and I'll get to it in a minute. But what we've realized in studying it, we and the field in general, um, is that each of us has a complex community of microorganisms um, that live in and on us. And over disease, the composition of these microbes change. And so you have what's called dysbiosis, and this is usually a contraction of this diversity of organisms. And so this can be that you can get expansions of things that are not normally pathogenic, but can become pathogenic, and those are referred to as pathobionts. Um, you can have just reductions of diversity, so lose multiple classes of organisms, or you can lose some of our more beneficial microbes, some of those microbes that give that support our general health. And every disease um, that people have studied um, are associated with shifts in the microbiota. And so whether that is cause or effect of the disease situation, cancer or um, infection or um, inflammatory disease, is a really very interesting um, area of research. And so what does the microbiota do for us? Um, within our intestine, which is what's represented by these orange um, cells with some villi, um, the microbiota, which is in the lumen, the center of the intestine, um, and is separated from our internal tissue by this single layer of, of epithelial cells. And it is really important for us metabolically. So the microbiota actually breaks down um, a lot of our undigestible components of our food and provides up to 20% of our caloric requirements every day. Um, and so it's really important for our complete metabolic health. Um, the microbiota is also our first line of immune defense, um, not our own immune system, though I am loath to admit it. So by being colonized with this large number of microorganisms, they prevent us from being colonized by pathogens. So they keep out things like salmonella and listeria that can cause disease. And they do this by eating up the nutrients. They do it by taking up the space, the places that these microbes can attach to. They also secrete antimicrobial factors to get rid of competitors because they want to live in this environment with all this good food and warm and safe. Um, the microbiota also communicates with us. It communicates with our intestine, with the intestinal epithelium. Um, and it does this to help promote the function of the intestine. So keeping that epithelium healthy, um, helping it to repair from injury, signals from the microbiota are very key for this. And then the microbiota is also very important for supporting the immune system. Um, and then the immune system can then feed back and help to support the barrier function and this interrelationship um, with these microbes. And so, as I said, I study the immune system and I study the immune system within the intestine. And the way that I think of the immune system is that its job is normally to support the tissue function. Um, and so in order to do that, the immune system needs to be able to tell what should be there, our self, our tissues, um, with what shouldn't be there, a pathogen or um, cancer even. And so in order to do this appropriately, the immune system needs to know where it is. So it needs to understand tissue specific information um, and environmental cues so that it can respond in the heart the way the heart needs it and the lungs the way the lungs need it. And these two tissues are different. They have different requirements. And so the immune system needs to be different in both of these places. And breakdown of this differentiation between self and non-self or the ability to respond appropriately underlies pretty much all human diseases. And you can find immune defects or immune um, misregulation in obviously autoimmunity or allergies or chronic infections, but also, um, as, as just clearly mentioned, in, in cancer.
And so improving the immune system's function then can help you deal with a lot of these diseases. And so within the intestine, um, the intestinal microbiota is one of these signals. And so in, in our work, we try and understand how the microbiota tells the immune system what to do, how these cues help it to promote tissue repair when there's an injury, but not too much repair so you end up with a tumor formation, how it can kill microbes that penetrate in when you have an infection, um, but not too much so that you damage the tissue. And so the microbiota supports the immune system in myriad ways, um, directly and indirectly. Um, and when we look at mice that are devoid of all microbes, germ-free mice, um, they have significantly defective immune systems. They have very few, few immune cells and they're disorganized. They don't talk to each other well. So the microbial signals are really important for setting up the immune system. But the immune system also recognizes specific members of the microbiota. And this is starting to be understood in, in humans, but in mouse models, it's, it's much more advanced. And there has been identification of specific members of the microbiota. So specific microbes that normally live within the intestine and so segmented filamentous bacteria, SFB is one I'm going to talk about quite a bit, um, or Clostridia or Bacteroides fragilis or a number of other bacteria that stimulate the immune system to make specific responses that recognize these microbes. And these can be beneficial, they can support um, epithelial and intestinal function, or they can be pathogenic as what happens in inflammatory bowel disease where you have T cells that recognize intestinal microbes and cause pathology within the intestine. And so back to this question of these T cells that can recognize non-self, things that are not us, as, as um, we were just told about. Um, those, those T cells develop in an organ called the thymus. And so the thymus is above the heart. And in the thymus, its job is to generate functional T cells. And so a T cell in development, it rearranges its T cell receptor, which is how it tells uh, how it recognizes the outside world. Most of these don't work, the cells die. A lot of those cells recognize self-protein. They recognize our self-proteins. And this is the problem with cancer, is that those cells are then negatively selected. So if it's a protein is thought to be um, a self-protein, the T cell will not make it out of the body. And so that's one of the things that, you know, immunizing against cancer, what makes it so challenging. A small, small, small subset of T cells then are positively selected. They have a T cell receptor that works, that recognizes things that aren't self and will hopefully recognize non-self proteins, but it's not sure what they're going to recognize. And then these go out into the body, they circulate around and they look for things to respond to. But what about these microbiota specific T cells? We have T cells that recognize microbes. These microbes live in us and on us at all times. How are they developing and is there a role for the thymus in this? And so we started on a, a project um, to, to, ask, um, to ask how these T cells developed. And we used what's called the Tetramer to track antigen specific T cells. And so as, as we know, um, a T cell has on its surface a T cell receptor and this receptor interacts with an antigen presenting cell that is holding out the antigen um, for the T cell to check out. And if these recognize each other, if they match up, the T cell can then become activated, can proliferate, can deal with the infection at hand. Um, but we can use this knowledge of this interaction and the, the antigen and the, um, and the major histocompatibility proteins, the proteins that are holding the antigen, and develop a reagent to stain T cells that can recognize it. So this is called a tetramer. You take four of these MHC molecules with the antigen, you stick them on a bead, you stick a color on them, and then you can use them in something called flow cytometry. And in that, the cells go one by one, um, shine with a laser, and you look for cells that stain with this fluorescent protein. And so we use these to then look at how microbiota-specific T cells could be generated. And so with this, we took mice. And then we gave them this segmented filamentous bacteria. And the reason we use this bacteria is it's one of the few microbes where there is a microbiota-specific T cell uh, tetramer that exists. And we did this at weaning or at adulthood. So weaning is where you take a mouse and you take it away from its mom and you put it in its own cage. It's like it's, it's gone off to college or something and has to cook for itself. Um, and so in mice that don't have SFB, which is shown here, you basically have no cells that are recognizing the SFB, and that would be in that box. So this is flow cytometry. On one axis, you have a red color. On the y-axis, on the x-axis, you have a blue, uh, a blue color. And cells that have been stained with both of these tetramers are going to line up in that box um, and be both colors. 
And so if you colonize mice with SFB, what we see then is in the young mice, you have expansion of T cells that are recognizing this intestinal microbe, but that's not happening in the adult mice. And this is just your number. So there's not a ton of them. We're talking about 200 of them in the thymus, um, but it is enough that they are expanding and we can see them. And so how is this happening? Antigen specific expansion of T cells has never been shown, especially not to a microbial antigen. Um, and so what we did was we looked for whether we could see the SFB getting to the thymus. And so we do this by qPCR, looking for um, the presence of, we look for the presence of the microbial DNA. And then you colonize mice with this SFB. You can find it in the feces because it's in the intestinal tract. And then when we look in the thymus, which you can see in the young adult, in the young mice, um, you see the presence of the SFB reaching the thymus, but you don't see it in the adult. And so we asked how long this lasted for. Um, and it's really, really, really quick. So you colonize them and one week later, you can see the, um, the bacterial signal in the thymus, um, but by two weeks it's gone. So very briefly, the bacteria gets to the thymus and then it goes away. And it's not getting throughout the body, it's not just leaking. So when we look in other organs, we see it in the thymus, we see it in the mesenteric lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are these um, tissues where immune cells get together and talk and say, well, have you seen you know, that bad thing? And you, um, if you have, you expand. Um, and so in the lymph node for the intestine, we also see the SFB, but we don't see it in, in the heart or the lung. So the bacteria is not traveling freely through the body. And just to prove that it was not just weird SFB that was doing this, we colonized mice with E. coli, and this will be relevant at the end, um, but we could see it in the feces, and similarly, we could see it in, in the thymus. And importantly, E. coli is culturable, and we don't see live bacteria getting through the, into the body. And so what I've told you is that early life, this is when the microbiota at weaning is becoming stabilized. The mice are moving to a solid, normal diet. You're getting more diversity. You're getting more expansion of these microbes. And these microbes are being brought to the thymus, and it's generating more T cells that can recognize them. So our next question was, how is the bacteria getting to the thymus? And so for this, we use mice that were generated here at MSK um, called kick GR mice. So these mice express a green fluorescent protein in every cell of their body. And you shine a four or five nanometer laser on them and the cells and the protein switches from green to red. And so you can take a mouse, you can expose its cecum, you can shine the light on it. The cecum will go, the cells in the cecum will go from green to red. You can stitch the mouse back up. And then you can look in other organs and wherever you see red cells, you know they came from the cecum that they traveled. And so this is just, again, flow cytometry. We have um, GFP on the X axis, so that's all the cells in the body. And the RFP is the one going up. And there's red cells in all of the organs um, that we looked at, which means that cells are normally coming from the cecum throughout the body, which was also surprising to us. And when we look in the thymus, we could see that specific populations of immune cells were coming to... Um, coming to the thymus um, in the young mice that weren't going there in the old mice. And so there was a difference in the kinds of cells that were traveling from the intestine um, to the thymus. And so we had made mice where we could delete these cells and ask what happened. And what happens is you lose the bacteria in the thymus and you lose the expansion of the T cells that can recognize the bacteria. And so what we think is happening then is as the microbiota is stabilizing, as you're getting colonized, these Immune cells in the intestine are picking up these microbes, they're killing them, and then they're bringing them to the thymus in a specific way to then allow for expansion of these microbiota-specific T cells. So what? Do these, um, do these T cells actually do anything? Are they functional? And so to test this, we took um, a model of colitis where micro-recognizing T cells cause disease. And so you isolate the T cells from a donor and you put them into a recipient where they're going to expand and be pathogenic. And so for this, we took cells from the thymus of mice colonized with this SFB or not and transferred them. And what you could see is in the black are the mice um, where the donors didn't have the SFB and they remained relatively healthy. And then the ones that were colonized with the SFB got sicker and they had more intestinal pathology and there were a lot more SFB recognizing T cells in the intestine. And if the adult mice were donors, we saw no pathology. And so we don't think the system actually is in place to cause immuno reactions to the microbiota. We actually think it's to help us recognize pathogens in a more specific way. And so to model this, we used E. coli. 
And we used E. coli because while E. coli is not, this E. coli is not pathogenic, some E. coli can be, um, we and others have found that there's cross-reactivity between the T cell responses and the B cell resp responses between E. coli and the pathogen Salmonella. And so you can colonize mice with Salmonella and they get very, very sick and they will die. But you can give the mice this E. coli um, at weaning and you can protect them, you can immunize them by, um, from the salmonella infection. And that doesn't work if you get rid of the CD4 T cells. And so what we think is happening then is that these microbiota specific T cells then can migrate out, travel through the body. And we think that this is happening because it's a template for non-self. It tells our immune system, these are foreign and you should pay attention to them. If they get into the body, it's probably something bad. Um, so it's helping the immune system to be ready to deal with a pathogen. Um, and it's also helping the immune system to compartmentalize the commensals, keep those things in the gut where they do good and don't let them get into the body and, and know that you, you know, if they get somewhere else, you can recognize them quickly and respond to them. And so what are we doing now? We are trying to figure out how to use this to our advantage. Can we use this to help immunize better to pathogens? Can we turn the system on um, in the adult um, and help to immunize against new antigens, tumor antigens, et cetera? There's, there's a lot to understand, um, and we're, we're pretty excited to be here to do it. And so with that, to, of course, thank the members of the lab who, who did all the work um, funding, and of course, you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, great. Gretchen, thank you. Uh, okay, among many questions, first I want to say we did get a question, will there, be, where, will there be a recording available afterwards? I just want to remind everyone there will be a recording on our webpage on mskcc.org in a few days. Awesome. Okay, so a um, lot of questions related to microbiome, as you might imagine, and I'll try to get through many of them. First, how much does the microbiome differ between different people? It's a super good question. And there is, um, it depends on what level of, of diversity you're talking about. So we have the same groupings of bacteria. We all have a lot of bacteroidetes. For acuities, there's types of bacteria that we all have in common because they have functions that we need like breaking down of fiber. Um, but at the species level, at the individual microbe level, there's a good degree of, of differences. And those differences are true among siblings, uh, between twins, between parent and child, et cetera. And so individual to individual, there, there's a lot of diversity um, at the, when you look at the very fine detail, but the big picture, we're pretty similar as long as we live in the same environment and eat the same kinds of food. A vegetarian is going to be very different than a carnivore, but other than that. Okay. Um, related to that, what about during cancer? Does cancer change the microbiome or does cancer therapy alter the microbiome? Also a super good question. And it's going to depend on the type of, of cancer, of course. Um, and there's some super, super cool work being done actually that cancers have their own microbiome associated with them. So there are microbes that get into the tumors. And so there are a lot of people who are using that to see if there's a diagnostic um, that they can establish. So if you have a specific type of microbe that is associated with a specific kind of cancer, can you detect that? Um, the other thing I know more about GI, you know, uh, you know, colorectal cancer, and there are specific um, shifts in microbiota. There are specific microbes that are associated with tumors, and some of those are actually tumor-promoting microbes that support um, cellular proliferation, et, et cetera. Um, and so there's, there's causal relationships with changes in the microbiota as well as just general ones. And of course, with the myriad therapies that people have, a lot of people are on antibiotics to prevent secondary infections. They're on things that activate the immune system. All of those can shift the microbiota as well. Several questions about development of a microbiome in childhood. Yep. So what factors affect that? And in particular, does germ exposure in childhood contribute to a healthy microbiome? <laughs> so that is the way it is modeled right now. So it's known that people who have a more diverse microbiota um, when they're younger have less, um, ex have less uh, prevalence of allergies and things like that. Um, and so the idea, it's a hygiene hypothesis, is that the more dirty things you're exposed to, um, the less your immune system is going to be distracted um, and respond to things it shouldn't. Um, and so um, 
diversity is good. Um, again, I think, you know, licking dirt and stuff like that, not the best idea because there might be pathogens there. So that's not my favorite answer. Um, diet is one of the things that I think really helps shape the microbiota. So diverse diet, you know, whole foods kind of thing are going to encourage the growth of many, many things. You know, if you eat only one kind of food, you're only going to encourage the growth of the microbes that like to live in that environment. Okay. I think we have time for just one or two more. So, uh, can a cancer-associated microbiome be used as a biomarker of a newly arising cancer? Yeah, so people are trying to figure out if they can. The signatures are not completely clear that there is 100% overlap between one type of... Because, again, people have different microbes associated with them. It's a little bit complicated that way, but there, people are trying to figure out if there are signatures where you can see specific types of bacteria um, in the blood that then correspond to, yes, you should get checked for this type of tumor. And can the composition of your microbiome affect the, uh, your risk of developing cancer? Um, that is, um, it's speculated. So there, are some, there are some microbes that seem to be present before tumors develop, but whether they are directly causing tumors, it's not clear. There are definitely microbes that are cancerogenic or tumorigenic, but those tend to be viruses. So there are definitely viruses that can cause cellular proliferation. And for bacteria, which is more what I study, there are people who are trying to figure that out. Okay. Uh, final question that we have time for. It's a basic science one. Um, you touched on it, but it's worth uh, revisiting. How do T cells develop receptors to a bacterial cell? Okay, so <laughs> thymic selection in 30 seconds. Um, so the T-cell receptor um, has a number of different genetic elements that recombine in the thymus. So there's, there are enzymes that cut it up and then glue them back together. And so it's a random rearrangement of genetic elements in the T-cell. And so that working... Um, and so that will give you a random assortment of receptors that come out on the cell surface of the T-cell. Um, and then that sort of stochastic um, event then leads to your whole repertoire. And so what we think is happening is that the exposure to the microbiota or these specific microbes are expanding ones that are relevant. Um, we don't think it's changing the selection or the development of the T-cells, but that's an awesome question. Okay, Gretchen, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, I think we didn't quite get Gretchen to say, I don't know, or we don't know, but um, she's, as you said, coming from a very fundamental idea about new ideas into science that distinguishes the researchers in our Sloan Kettering Institute. And they come up with new ways to treat uh, cancer or come up with new pathways to explore that might regulate cell proliferation in this dialogue that she's told us about, for example, between the microbiome and um, how we regulate our immune system. And we would like to try to see if that would prove cancer therapy. Well, we have a division here at Memorial Sloan Kettering that carries out the best of those investigations, does the first experimental evidence in man, which is an incredibly daunting transition from doing this in a mouse, proving the principle might be reasonable in a mouse model or an animal model, to actually thinking about how do we safely and effectively bring new therapies into the clinic. And they can be clinical therapies that are based on small molecules, what we call chemotherapeutic agents. More and more, they're focused on precision medicine, the kinds of inhibitors that we can make against genes that are mutated in the formation of cancer. And they're the immunotherapies we've just heard about from Vinod uh, and in some of the programs that he's working on. But um, our next and final speaker is Alex Drillon. He's a medical oncologist, and he's the leader of the program that allows us to safely do first-in-man clinical trials to explore new therapeutic approaches that offer such hope and opportunity for better treatments of cancers. Alex got his undergraduate and his medical degree from the University of the Philippines. We were lucky enough during his clinical training that he came here for fellowship training, and then he has been one of the leaders of how we explore early drug development on our service and particularly expert at fit what are called phase one clinical trials. That's sometimes confusing to the community. A phase one clinical trial is just simply to ask, does this new drug that we'd like, we think has a principle that might improve cancer therapy, does it, is it safe enough to give people? And so the goal of the clinical study that Alex first initiates 
is, is it safe enough? When we really find an exciting new drug, such as the drug Gleevec, that was used for the treatment of chronic myelogenous leukemia two decades ago that launched the precision medicine episode, we never finished that phase one trial because we find out before it causes toxicity that it actually puts patients into either remission or cures them. And that was one of the most exciting transitions. Just in the last year, Memorial Sloan Kettering participated on Alex's service with one of the next drugs that was went through a, never completing a phase one trial being approved by the FDA as a new therapeutic for the treatment in this case of leukemia without ever going through the further stages of clinical development. But Alex and his team have been pioneers in leading the development of new precision medicine therapies over this last decade. And I'm pleased to really have him give us an overview of his program. He's been particularly focused at getting drugs into early age groups. We're seeing cancer unfortunately move into the age group of some of our listeners um, under the age of 18. Memorial is launching a new program that Alex will be part of, which is our adolescent and young adult cancer program, which has actually been one of the fastest rising populations in cancer. And we don't really understand that. So we're going to evolve and research. You may know a classmate or a friend who has come down with cancer. And most therapies have not been tested on people under the age of 18. And Alex has been leading that transition with the FDA. So, um, I want to introduce him here to be our final cleanup speaker. He's got a great title, Hitting the Target, the Using using Targeted Therapy to Treat Cancer. Alex, come to the show. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Thanks for the invitation to come and speak. Um, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, we live in very exciting times. Uh, and I had our service, which is called the Early Drug Development Service, that's really focused on finding new cancer treatments for our patients. And I'm very lucky because it's a very diverse team of people with various specialties, uh, various age focuses, and various cancer type focuses. Um, and as was mentioned, we focus not just on immune therapies, but also on targeted therapies. And that's going to be the center of the talk today. All right. And how are we able to develop these new treatments? Well, certainly it all starts with finding these targets. And uh, in very simple terms, these gene targets are changes in genes that live in cancer. Um, less frequently, they might be inherited or, or genetic. Um, but these result in activation of the gene, so much so that we say that it becomes central or it becomes a driver of cancer growth or oncogenesis, so the driver of the bus, if you will. Many of these gene changes are either mutations, they can also be fused where a gene might partner to activate another gene. And then sometimes you have too many copies of a gene. We call that amplification. A lot of what we're going to talk about today focuses on the second bucket of fusions where one gene hooks up with another gene to increase its activity to cause cancer. And um, I specialize beyond early drug development in lung cancer, which is really an archetype for a cancer where you find many of these oncogenic drivers or these gene targets. Um, and this is an exercise that we conducted here at Memorial um, with a test called Next Generation Sequencing. The actual name of it is called MSK Impact. And if you just look at the two pie charts, you'll see how history has really marched forward from the late 90s, where the only gene target that we knew about that, that was a driver of lung cancer was KRAS, um, which made up about one out of every four cases. And fast forward to this year, where if you look at our report card in terms of sequencing, the unknown slice of the pie, which is that black slice in the pie chart, is now down to 12%. So all all of these other gene changes that might potentially match patients to targeted therapies have filled out the pie. And it's really exhilarating to work in this space. Now, beyond that, um, extending beyond the borders of lung cancer, uh, we've also found that this applies to many other cancer types. So this is, again, an exercise here at Memorial 
where we use that big sequencing assay called MSK impact. But this time we looked at many different cancer types. So perhaps focus first on the very right where you see a list of different tumor types. So gastrointestinal tumors, thyroid cancers, breast cancers, melanomas, really a gamut of the many different types of cancers that we treat here um, at Memorial. Um, and you'll see that a number of these targets of varying levels of evidence were found across these different uh, cancer types. Um, and in fact, if you look at that pie chart in the middle, um, almost 40% of the time, we found what we call an actionable alteration. And you'll find out what that means today. It essentially means that the gene target can be paired with an active targeted therapy that will treat the cancer. Um, and finally, before we leave the slide, thanks to this endeavor of a very um, comprehensively looking for these drivers, um, many of these patients were enrolled under our clinical trials um, and helped get some of these drugs that we're going to talk about approved um, for patients around the world, so not just within the United States. So um, we go to this very simple diagram, um, which uh, teaches us about targeted therapy. Um, and one way of describing it is essentially the um, target, which is the gene change, um, is sort of the lock that targeted therapy or the key fits in. Um, and when it's a really good match and you have really good drug design, the key is well designed, so to speak, um, you're in a position to shut down the activity of the cancer, kill cancer cells um, and control um, someone's disease. Um, and we're going to give you a few examples today. So um, we talked about this earlier. This is the team at Memorial that focuses on developing new therapies. It's the early drug development service. And really the goal um, is to develop the newest precision medicine therapies for patients with cancer. Um, and that's just another term for everything we've talked about, essentially. Being very precise with finding the exact target that matches someone, a very active targeted therapy. Um, and the first story here is about a target called NTRAC. And I said we'd really focus on fusions where uh, genes partner um, so that uh, one of the genes, NTRAC in this case, is highly activated um, and drives cancer growth. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that if you look at the diagrams here, these fusions are found, one, across many different cancer types. So brain cancers, lung, gastrointestinal cancer. Um, sarcomas, a very diverse array of many different tumors. But number two, they're also found across um, many different ages. So you see on the right that there are several pediatric cancers that are enriched for these targets, the NTRAC fusions. Um, and it's not just the adolescent young adult population um, that Dr. Thompson talked to you about, but um, some of these cancers are in babies. So infants who have sarcomas that harbor these NTRAC fusion targets. And so this really gave birth a very different strategy of designing clinical trials because in the past, a lot of our studies were focused on just looking at one cancer type um, and only, let's say, treating breast cancer, period. But given the recognition that there are situations like this where a target might be found um, across many different ages and many different cancer types, we mounted what we call a basket trial, where essentially everyone, um, regardless of cancer type, regardless of how it looks under the microscope, as long as they have the target of interest, they go into the same basket. Um, so it's essentially uh, what we call a tumor agnostic approach um, to developing targeted therapy. And it was also age agnostic, uh, meaning that we took patients um, regardless of their age, as long as they had cancers with an NTRAC fusion. Um, and here you have the first data set for one of these pills. So these are oral therapies, really fascinating because now we're able to treat cancer, not the best analogy, but in a way like hypertension or diabetes, if you will, with pills that patients get a bottle from the pharmacy and they take a pill once or twice a day. Obviously for pediatric patients, we have liquid formulations which apply to this drug, but this drug is called larotrectinib. Um, it is a targeted therapy. 
it inhibits TRAC, which is the protein product of NTRAC um, that's activated in this fusion space. Um, and you'll see these waterfall plots. So these show you um, the degree of shrinkage of cancer in response to the targeted therapies. And the more downgoing bars are negative bars that you have, the better the response is. Um, and the first punchline is that the waterfall plot above shows you different um, cancer types that are color coded. Um, and many of these cancers responded regardless of where the cancer began, right? So um, we saw tumor agnostic proof of principle that targeted therapy can work in this molecular setting. Um, on the lower left, it also didn't seem to matter what the exact fusion was. So whether or not it was NTRAC1 or 2 or 3 or which particular gene it hooked up with, um, many patients still responded to this pill. And then finally, and this is a historic moment for drug development, but a third of cases were pediatric cases. Um, and that's fortunate because be before this, the way we used to investigate targeted therapies in the pediatric population really lagged behind the investigation in adults. And now we're contemporaneously investigating targeted therapies across different age groups. And the inclusion of this pediatric population actually helped get this drug approved. They were one out of three cases. So really marvelous that we're accelerating things and being much more inclusive in how we develop new drugs. Um, this slide just shows you the updated uh, data set now with many more patients. And you see beyond that first pill that I talked about, lartrectinib, below you have a second pill that we also spearheaded in terms of development called intrectinib. Um, you'll see very nice waterfall plots, responses regardless of cancer type, very high likelihood of response. That's the objective response rate or ORR that you see there. And these patients can stay on for sometimes years. I have patients who we first treated in 2014, 2015, um, had a phenomenal response to therapy, and they're still going on the same treatment that they had very good cancer control. Now, um, we did mention that there are some um, babies that develop cancers that have these fusions, um, and these can be very debilitating because the particular type is a sarcoma called congenital fibrous sarcoma. Um, and normally these tumors, as you can see on the right, can be extremely bulky and require amputations. But because we were very forward thinking on this trial, and we said that in this state that's not um, amenable to a good surgery or radiation that we might employ targeted therapy, we were able to find these cancers with the NTRAC fusion, treat these babies. Um, they had very, very good shrinkage. You see the left and the right before and after photos of this sarcoma with the NTRAC fusion target. Um, and actually, they were able to get to limb sparing surgery. So we were able to save these babies' legs. Um, and when we looked to see if there was any cancer left, many of the these um, uh, these babies had no cancer, what we call a pathologic complete response, which just really underscores how sensitive these cancers can be to targeted therapy. Now, the second major story here is that um, while we've become more inclusive with study design and that's helped some drugs cross the finish line, uh, we're also seeing improvements in the way we design targeted therapies. Um, and the story that uh, we're going to talk about next is the story of RET, also a fusion. Um, it's found in some thyroid and lung cancers. Um, and to make a long story short, we used to have um, crappier drugs which we called multi-kinase inhibitors because they were kind of dirty and inhibited the target RET, but also hit a bunch of other things. And that caused lots of side effects. And we had to change patients' doses because of that. But in 2017, there was this new wave of rational drug design. So we really understood that we had to develop cleaner drugs, more selective inhibitors. And in this kinome dendrogram, so this tree of stuff that you can inhibit um, in cancer or the human body, you'll see that these newer selective inhibitors, salpercatinib, um, as you can see here, 
really zoomed in on the target and avoided the inhibition of the other stuff that resulted in side effects. So, you know, these drugs, uh, because of this, they actually had more punch because we were able to dial up to doses where we more meaningfully inhibited target. And we really saw the gains here. So if you compare the uh, results of rational drug design with these selective inhibitors to the prior multi-kinase inhibitors, we saw uh, more than a doubling of the response response rate. They were much more tolerable because they were cleaner drugs. Um, and because the report card was so good, we helped get um, salpercatinib approved by the FDA. And it's now approved across many other uh, regulatory healthcare agencies. Um, and uh, the story that um, I like to tell with the permission of our patient who's shown here um, with the red fusion positive lung cancer um, is Melissa's story. She had um, this target in her lung cancer. Uh, we thankfully got her on this trial. Um, she did a complete 180. You know, she had lots of symptoms from her cancer that pretty much disappeared um, with these rationally designed targeted therapies. Um, and we put her on in 2017. She remains on treatment today. But the phenomenal thing about Melissa is that she um, started the first patient group. So patient advocacy group of uh, patients with cancers dependent on RET. And so it's really, this, it's really spreading the word that we have these newer treatments that can really turn things around. Um, in the last few minutes, um, I, I will talk about um, next steps that we're taking um, so that the new treatments that we develop, we don't, we don't stop with the earlier generation drugs. Um, and it's a story about resistance. So um, while it's a stochastic process, Process, certainly, I like to think a bit. I like to think of this as cancers learning how to outsmart what we throw at them and develop resistance. Um, and so, if we go back to the Entrac fusion story, what usually happens is you acquire new gene changes that um, allow the cancer to outsmart a first generation targeted therapy. Um, and in this situation, those red dots there represent um, cells that have acquired a resistance mutation. And these are quite interesting because they result in changes at the protein level um, that create blockages, if you will, that prevent the earlier generation drugs from effectively binding target and inhibiting cancer growth. Um, so what we're doing in the service is that we're partnering with companies to design these next generation inhibitors, next generation pills. Um, and I love the, the conceptual process here of designing these new drugs. You know, if there's a blockage, why not design smaller drugs to zoom past the blockage and re-engage the, the binding site and shut down cancer growth? And that's exactly what these are. You know, in fancy terms, they're smaller macrocycles, which re-engage the kinase domain. Um, but they're really just sort of, sort of smaller entities um, that avoid the steric penalties um, of these amino acid substitutions that result from the mutations. Um, and again, we're seeing results um, that touch patient lives. So this is a gentleman with a secretory carcinoma with an NTRAC fusion target, um, flies to us from China um, to get his care here. On the very lower left, you'll see that he had a nasty cancer um, that we didn't even need to do scans. Um, you know, it was, it was very uh, visible externally. And with the first generation pill, entrectinib, the cancer melted away and he was on it for a few years. But unfortunately, the cancer did develop resistance mediated by one of these mutations. We put him on one of the second gen or next generation, smaller, rationally designed drugs. Um, and the cancer began to melt away again. Um, and now um, one of these drugs is breakthrough designation by the FDA, which is really a nod to hopefully the treatment getting approved soon um, in the next few years. So uh, coming to the end, just a, a little bit more about the service, if you're interested. Um, you, one of the things that's been um, a key to our success is that we have an algorithm that uh, is really plugged into the assay MSK impact that I talked about so that whenever the, um, the sequencing report is spit out, and a patient's cancer is found to have one of these targets, immediately an email is sent to me if I'm the head of the clinical trial and the treating oncologist. So it really allows us to get patients much more quickly onto these very active new targeted therapies. Um, and as you can see here, the minute we instituted this process, it, the number of patients that we put on clinical trials, as you can see on the left, um, began, to rose began to rise substantially. Um, and that resulted in the 
Amtrak uh, fusion success story that you heard about, which was the first story of this talk. Um, and finally, we continue to put a, a premium on the science. And uh, we're now a uh, very complicated slide, but the punchline here is we're looking at how these cancers develop resistance to next generation therapies. And so it seems like in the NTRAC situation, there are these newer mutations that result in changes in how the protein um, is configured. Um, and uh, it, really the bottom line is that we need to design better inhibitors that maybe engage the target in a different way um, in order to reestablish cancer control. Um, and finally, just to show you um, how effective um, the strategy has been here. Um, in the last few years, we've gotten six drugs approved um, and uh, the approvals for one or more of these have extended to many other countries outside the US. Uh, in fact, at least 40 countries um, as per our last count. So with that, um, thanks advances in testing, we're finding new targets across many different cancers, many different agents. These targets match patients to active targeted therapies. Our study designs continue to evolve and improve and become much more inclusive. And by learning about resistance, we've opened the door to the discovery of new treatments for patients with cancer. Thanks for your attention. Alex, thank you, that was great. So among many questions coming in, uh, we'll start with one of the first ones I got. Um, so what happens if a cancer continues to learn how to resist a drug? Yeah, so that goes back to what I was saying about us trying to understand sort of sequentially what the gene changes are that drive resistance. I think a common theme is some of the earliest patterns of resistance result in the cancer regaining um, increased activity of that particular target, but more and more as you expose these cancers to targeted therapy, they kind of phone a friend and uh, via bypass resistance, they activate other genes. And so we're looking at things like combination therapies uh, to potentially circumvent um, that type of evolution. But, you know, it, it also goes back to immune therapy. I think at the end of the day, are we able to, for some of these cancers that are technically cold tumors, um, affect an immune response at allow us to achieve much more durable control that some targeted therapies just can't achieve longitudinally. Okay, thank you. That was great. We had several questions about combining different targeted therapies, so fantastic. What does the TRAC protein do to cells that makes the driver in so many different kinds of cancer? So it's, uh, it's the same story for other drivers, essentially. So the fusion or mutation or amplification, it results in activation of the oncoprotein or the protein that drives cancer growth. Um, and it helps cancers grow, it helps cancers spread or metastasize. Uh, and by doing that, we see the effects that we see in patients with cancer. Tumors get bigger, tumors spread to other parts of the body, et cetera. And because that's so central to the process of cancer growth and spread, if you knock it down, if you hit the target, um, then you can achieve these phenomena nominal responses. Related to that, um, what does the pill do? The inhibitors to track, what do they do to track? So they're, the technical term is they're kinase inhibitors because track has a kinase portion that's responsible for activity. Um, so it binds to that region and shuts it down. And it shuts down that entire process that we just talked about. You mentioned um, some patients who are on inhibitors for years, RET inhibitors, TRAC inhibitors. Are there side effects to being on these kinds of drugs for that long? Yeah, and thankfully we're understanding these side effects more and more because we understand the biology of inhibiting these targets, which are also present in non-cancer cells or non-neoplastic cells. Um, so studies where we knock out these genes or we have decreased activity of these targets teach us about the consequences of inhibition. Um, and so we can predict some of these side effects and come up with mitigation strategies to make things better when we give these inhibitors to patients. Towards the beginning of your talk, you showed that a percentage of lung cancers had no known driver mutations. Do we understand anything about these cancers? We're trying to. I do think that my talk was very focused on gene changes, but there are other changes like epigenome changes, so changes that happen at the methylation level, et cetera, that might drive some of these cancers where it's not clear that there's a gene signature that's driving cancer growth. 
Okay, we'll have time. We'll squeeze in two more. Uh, this one connects all three talks to the drugs that you talked about um, have effects on the immune system. So um, these targeted therapies, many of them are not like chemotherapy in that they can uh, sometimes substantially dampen the immune system. Um, in fact, some of them that are very clean, if the target isn't involved uh, in immune regulation, you know, for the most part, these patients have competent immune systems. Um, so it's unlikely, but I don't think we fully understand the consequences um, of all of the agents that we give. Uh, but that's what we're focusing on in the service. So you mentioned learning how to treat younger and younger patients who are afflicted with cancer. And so this, this question came through. How difficult is it to tackle the issue of children under 18 with cancer? I think that um, it was much more difficult in the past. And now regulators like the FDA have issued guidance saying we should be looking at younger patients. Um, and we've done things like we've dropped the lower limit of age used to be 18 and now it's down to 12. We're trying to push that for many trials um, and also partner with our pediatric colleagues to put even younger patients on. Um, I think that there are certain challenges that are just inherent to the fact that it needs to be a different drug formulation because it needs to be a liquid suspension for younger patients, et cetera. But by and large in 2021, we're much better than where we were 10 years ago, substantially. Okay, thank you everyone for the great questions. And Alex, thank you very much. Thank you. So by my one count, just to summarize for Alex, so you got him to say, I don't know, or we don't know uh, once, uh, which was terrific and across the board, great questions. Um, I wanna give one other shout out though to Alex and his colleagues in the clinic. Um, one of the biggest and scariest things that our questioners just asked about was the fact that many of our traditional cancer therapies, the older style chemotherapy, do damage the immune system and damage the ability of immune cells to protect us, not just from the cancer, but also from infections. And so when COVID-19 hit New York 18 months ago, we were really scared for the 150,000 patients that were being treated here with traditional therapies for cancer and whose immune system might have been damaged by the more traditional forces. Alex, team and others in the clinical service really did tremendous research on this. We were able to very quickly determine whether or not we were able, individual patients who were going through therapy as they got COVID mounted an immune response effectively. And one of the great things that he just told you about, which is a real credit to his service, they were able to demonstrate that the cleaner some of those kinases were. If it wasn't something part of the immune system's normal role, the immune system stayed completely intact to protect from COVID. And those patients, they had the same risk of other people in the population, but they didn't have that extra risk of therapy. That really caused a tremendous sense of relief of the patients because cancer is not a diagnosis. You can wait through the 18 months we've had. We had to continue to treat patients. And so we have to help patients as we get that. And these therapies are delivering on that and delivering on our ability. In fact, the only patients that we now know in cancer have a really profoundly greater risk to the toxicity of COVID-19 are those cancers of the immune system, lymphocytes themselves. And so that's refocused our effort on the power of lymphocytes as protection for viruses. And we need to find new strategies that we're developing in other parts of the institution to help those patients as they deal with viral infections as they go through cancer therapy. But it's redoubled our efforts that you heard from Vinod and from uh, Gretchen about our immunotherapy approaches and understanding how the immune system fits into all of this. So we're right on time. I wanna thank you all for participating. I wanna thank all three speakers for stimulating talks and getting the great questions out. You can follow all of them on their Twitter accounts and then we're gonna show up a slide as we sign off on how to contact them. But we also wanna remind you that applications to our summer internship programs, particularly the 2022 HOP Summer Student Program will open on December 6th. And we hope to see some of you there applying for those programs. And for our, our people uh, that have joined us from around the world, we're welcome to the MSK community and please reach out to us with any questions you might have from tonight's symposium or anything we do here. And with that, I thank you all for attending and uh, be safe.